Hi everyone, hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk coming to you from live from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC. Streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app, this program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So hi there, my name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This, of course, all depends on when you're listening and joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to say Mazel Tov, because today marks the beginning of the expansion of this program, Jewish Talk, from 30 minutes to one hour, starting right now at 8 a.m. all the way through to 9, 9 a.m. Now, we encourage you all to call in when I announce the number, to join in the conversation, and we can also be seen on uh, the Facebook pages of WHBC and with uh, Anshul Pearl, my name, on Facebook. Join in the conversation. We look forward to hearing from you as we discuss many, many fascinating ideas. And we're going to go through uh, the topic of how to buy happiness, interviews about the current graduations, ceremonies, and all the events that are going on, and uh, other exciting ideas. And also, we'll try to make some comments about the current um, Supreme Court events that happened on uh, on Friday as we talk about the abortion issue. So let's get right into it here. So first of all, good morning. Thank you all for getting up earlier this morning to be able to join us. So how do we buy happiness? Happiness, yeah. Why is it that so many people, despite having so much, are so unhappy? Let's discuss together here. Let's discover some of Judaism's practical solutions which will help us build a positive emotion and resilience in this very, very elusive uh, area of our lives, of having happiness. The challenge is well known. Let's put it this way. Despite the relative affluence in today's society, too many people are unhappy. This indicates that health, prosperity, uh, and a good education are themselves not the defining factors that fuel happiness. So what then is the crucial ingredient for living a happy life? The Zohar, which is the classical work of esoteric Jewish mysticism, points out something fascinating. I'll first say it in Hebrew. The Asvon Besimcha Ihi Machshava. The letters forming the Hebrew word Besimcha, which translates with, sim- with joy, are the same letters that spelled Machshava, which means thought. There's direct relationship between being happy and the power of thought. Instead of joy being associated with our circumstances, it's associated with our thoughts. The answer to I can be happier if should resolve mostly around, it revolves, I should say, around our thought process and our attitudes. Therefore, most people do not have the ability to make significant changes in their life circumstances. Therefore, If it were true that a better education, warmer climate, a higher income are the most crucial keys for happiness, most people would not be able to enhance their emotional lives. How many of us can relocate to uh, Hawaii, right? Can, Can we simply decide to earn more without sacrificing other important areas in life? On the other hand, our mind, our mind can be in our, that is in our control. The most crucial key to our happiness, our mind, is something that we can regulate and modify. We therefore need to explore what types of thinking patterns we can adopt to introduce more joy into our life. I'd like to say good morning to those joining us. We have Linda Zellickson on, the, um, on Facebook. Denise Zellickson, thank you so much. Everybody on the radio, everybody watching and listening, we thank you. And we're now talking about how to buy happiness. So the challenge is, why is it that having more stuff doesn't automatically result in more happiness? And I share with you what the Medrash alludes to. It says the following, Ein odom yoytze min ha'olam v'chatsi tavosa v'yodei, which translates, We do not manage to leave this world with even half of our desires fulfilled. When we have a hundred, 
we want to turn it into 200. When we have 200, we want to make it into 400. When we earn something novel and special, it feels good for a while. But after a certain amount of time, the positive emotions wane. So we feel compelled to seek out something else. Psychologists call this adaptation. When you walk into, uh, into the pool, you are cold for the first few seconds. But the body adapts, and soon enough, you can feel, you do not feel so cold. Much of um, uh, human emotions works the same way. We experience an emotional spike of joy when we get something new. I remember when you first got your first iPhone or your uh, Android, whatever it was. But then it just becomes normal, shined. And when something is normal, uh, let me tell you, it just ceases to give us or cause happiness. So we seek out more. And this, uh, this goes on, this cycle just keeps on going. This has become known in the uh, psychiatric world or psychologists. They call it hedon uh, hedonic treadmill. It's a treadmill. In other words, the tendency to seek more is an outcome of the fact that we already have um, falls to make us happy. In addition, the tendency to desire more itself causes a lack of happiness. For when we are focused on getting more, we lose focus on what we already have. And therefore, we don't have the ability to gain any happiness from it. Nobody's, nobody's happy with what they have. So they, The result is, people who have many blessings in their lives, but nevertheless are none the happier before what all they have. Good morning to Zalman Wag. Good morning to Michael Wengroff. He watches us on Facebook all the way from Germany. Thank you so much. So what's the solution to buying happiness? How do, how do we handle it? How do we get it there? So how can we experience joy over things that we have? So I want to share with you, it comes from a text of the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe. He discusses this and it will help us appreciate uh, and at least begin a conversation about the solution of how to live a more happier life. And what, is he, what he says is very simply, when a person pours feelings of love into words, the act of speaking these words fuels and intensifies the love. Through speaking about it, the emotional energy radiates with more passion, and the person is more aroused with more love and fondness for the beloved. And the same applies to all emotions. When there are not, person does not express them through speech, guess what? They're reduced until they completely dissipate. When they are expressed verbally, they grow considerably. This idea, um, this actually helps us. It also key, it's, it's the key to the problem, but also holds the key, the insight to the solution. By focusing on and especially by talking about the good in our lives, we actually foster happy emotions. The more we focus on it and talk about it, the more intense those happy feelings will grow and grow and glow, actually. And if we also dwell less on what we're missing, we will allow those negative feelings to dissipate. So fortunately, in Judaism, there's a built-in system that forces us to pay close attention and to speak about the good in our lives. It's called Hakoras Hatoiv, which translates to recognize the positive. It expresses itself in various mitzvahs, among them the mitzvah of Bikurim of first fruits. What is it all about? There was a mitzvah of Bikurim which was performed at the time in biblical times when the Jewish people were in the land of Israel during that biblical period. Each farmer would take the first fruits from each harvest, place them in a basket, and bring the basket to the holy temple in Jerusalem. The farmer would then offer a proclamation where he said, and he went through a whole wonderful speech of appreciation of where we'd come from, we'd go back in history, where he was today, it was expressing it. So the average Jewish farmer who brought the first fruits, who was maybe even born in Israel, and he had gone through this, you know, he was a farmer for many years. Nevertheless, and he become used to it, right? Every year, the same harvesting. This, and he realized he was not a slave uh, uh, as a result of coming out of Egypt because this was part of his declaration. It happened so many times ago. 
basically, this person who each year did the same thing, the chances are now that he does this, he now recognizes the blessings as he has. So, the Torah points out, if you express in word and in deed, remember he had took those fruits, put them into a basket, had to schlep all the way to Jerusalem, he literally in word, he made this declaration, he expressed it, and he did something, it brought positive results. So it's fascinating. The, the, um, in, in the actual presentation, in the biblical text, following this particular mitzvah, the, the text says, Following a person verbally and makes the effort to show thanks, he will ultimately live with joy. So the implication seems is that if we focus and verbalize gratitude, just like the farmer that brought him happiness, this ritualized gratitude you know, le left him to appreciate that he has blessings in this world. It doesn't let the positive emotion dissipate. He's looking at his fruit. He's traveling with his fruit. He's talking about his fruit. So it also helped him focus less on the things that he lacked and more on the gifts that he did have. So although the Holy Temple was destroyed and we don't have this, current, this particular ritual in our times, but the soul of this mitzvah, the message continues to be part of our life. How do we see this? And it's actually brought down that today, even though we don't have the opportunity to bring this first fruit, but it is part and parcel of the daily ritual of praying three times a day. So while people often think of prayer as a time of pleading and asking, the truth is much of Jewish prayer, prayer is in fact utterances of thanks and gratitude. This is something that um, Dr. Gary Spitz expressed to us yesterday in our synagogue as he celebrated his Jewish birthday, that to him, he opens up the Siddur and it's basically a book of thanks, of gratitude, verbal. And we spent two hours, you know, d uh, praying and reading. So in our prayers, nothing is taken for granted, but it is, we realize, is granted to us. Every single morning, we actually uh, thank God for being able to stand straight, to be able to walk, to have clothes, to have interactions, to see other people. Nothing is taken for granted. And the more we talk about it, the more verbalize it and act that way, the happier we become. There's another aspect of this. In the first thing that we do when we wake up in the morning is to turn on WHBC. No, the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning is to say Maidani. Maidani is a famous prayer. And what does it say? What are these first words that we say when we wake up? Th I thank you. Verb, words of thanks, living in the eternal king, for mercifully restoring my soul within me. Your faithfulness is great. Can you imagine? At the first words out of our mouth, before we check the email, before, I mean, talk about literally lying in bed, we've, you know, we say these words. This is just the beginning. That's the first words. Then the prayer book continues, presents a series of blessings, thanking us for the basic functioning of our body. We thank God every day that the plumbing works. I'm not talking about the plumbing in the house. I'm talking about the plumbing in the kishkas, you know what I mean? And that we're able to see, we're able to walk. So the entire day opens up with giving gratitude by saying it, verbalizing it. And the more we say it, the more happy we become. So when we build gratitude into our life, the result will be the similar, will be similar to like the farmer who brought the bakurim, the first fruits. We will find more happiness because we have, as we've already discussed, expressing the emotion feeds it and strengthens it. And uh, a lot of modern day research has proven this exactly. So uh, we, we need to, so therefore we have to stress the crucial point about gratitude in the Jewish tradition. Hakaras HaToyv in Judaism, this gratitude concept, it's not a mental note we make to ourselves about the things that we are, are going through, that are going right. It's not just counting our blessings. Rather, it's a daily conversation with God and when appropriate with human beings where we communicate our sense of gratefulness for the things that the Almighty God has given us and for His underlying care and love 
that motivates, that is motivated the giving. In other words, gratitude always has an address. I'm sure you know many people who it's impossible to get the word thank you out. They take, they live a life of entitlement. People who live a life of entitlement are not happy people. But if you can, it's a humbling experience to say thank you. People are afraid to say thank you because somehow then you become indebted. But guess what? A person who is able to say thank you is a more humble person and becomes a more happier person. This type of gratitude inspires much more joy than just a grateful mental note. We all know the difference when we get a, a thank you for a gift that we gave or a thank you for a donation that we made or a recognition. It makes a whole big difference. When people realize that God loves them and cares for them, it's an even greater source of happiness than the happiness they derive from a particular good circumstance in life. So I would like to say the following two hypothetical scenarios will make this point. Listen very carefully, dear friends. Scenario number one. Sarah is walking down the hallway at school and notices a chocolate bar on the floor. After asking around, she cannot find the owner. And the secretary of the school tells her, eh, just keep it. Hooray! Lucky day for, for Sarah. Rachel, this is scenario number two. Rachel is opening her backpack and surprise, one of her friends snuck a chocolate bar into her backpack with a little note saying, happy birthday. So all else being equal, whose good fortune will bring her more happiness? Is it Sarah, who finds a chocolate bar on the floor? Or Rachel, who finds it in her backpack with a note saying happy birthday? I wonder. Of course, I think you'd all agree with me, Rachel will be the happier one. Yes, they both got a bar of chocolate. <laughs> Not to be underestimated. But Rachel got so much more. In addition to the treat, she feels loved, cared for, connected, and she knows that someone was thinking about her. Now that's a priceless asset. The same is true for all of us. It is not only true that we all have so many blessings in our lives that can bring us much joy. It is also true that the Creator is looking out for us, caring for us, loving us, and providing us with the gifts in our life. And when we stop taking that for granted, guess what? We expand our capacity for joy tenfold. Some, something to think about and uh, think about this idea of how much we have in our lives that really make, make us and should make us happy. And the more we focus on being happy with what we have, as it says in the Mishnah, Isaiah Osher, who is a rich man? It doesn't say a rich man is how many fields and how many houses he has and how many cars and how many vacations he went on. It's being happy with what they have. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with aspiring to, to, um, to, to be able to have a lot of things in life, but it's appreciating them, thanking Hashem for them, and using them well and sharing them with others. There are many, you know, sadly, people have beautiful, beautiful homes, and, but no, nobody, no one to share them with. What is, so, so they're looking at it all day. Wonderful. The key is if a person shares their blessings, verbalizes them, shows gratitude, that person is going to live a far, far greater, greater, happier life. As promised, I want to share with you a couple of one-liners. Yeah, there a couple of one-liners. And the, the first one is... Um, you know, a lot of people this time of the year, they're finishing school and going here. So packing and relocating to a new home or going to camp can be, very, can be a, a very moving experience. If you didn't like that one, I'm going to give you another one. Many rabbis, my friends, many rabbis have decided to, to become roofing experts. And do you know why? Why do you think rabbis have become roofing experts? Because they're preparing for the hereafter. All right, never mind. Uh, the, it, listen, dear friends, you get what you pay for here, you know. I do want to say hello to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, our program began today at 8 a.m., and this is part of the expansion. Thank God. We appreciate WHBC giving us the opportunity to come to you for an extra 30 minutes, which allows us to have conversation, allows us to um, have interviews, and to broaden our uh, subject matter for 
for uh, on, on a weekly basis so spread it spread the word we can be heard both uh, right here on WHBC and we can be seen on the Facebook of WHBC and my own Facebook live and I'm waving out to everybody out there hi uh, Shalom Shalom thank you so much for waving back I, I can see you right now and I want to say let's so uh, who else do we have here we have some um, comments on the, on uh, Facebook Beautiful, I can see everybody who's joining us. Thank you again. So, um, I'd like, at this point, I'm going to do a little, a little musical interlude. And after that, we're going to uh, get into the conversation about graduations. And then, I'd like to open up the telephone lines. And So, think about this. Uh, I'll let you know when it's time to call in. But think about this question. What most inspired you? from your graduation it could have been this week it could have been last week it could have been 50 years ago I don't it doesn't matter all of us have graduated something in the course of our life from college from yeshiva whatever it may be and I'd like to hear from you what you remember and is it still having an impact on you on this at this time of your life it's that time again it's time of the year where uh, graduation season is upon us and all across the land as a new generation stands on the cusp of transitions from the years of formal education, a lot of people are starting their own careers. Tradition has sanctified this custom, and we call it, of course, commencement addresses. They're all, uh, you know, captive audiences, and they're there to celebrate a major milestone in, um, in life. But, of course, it depends on the speaker, <laughs> you know, at these events. They can either be exhilarating, inspirational, and that can have a meaningful impact on everybody listening, or it can be uh, condemned to a, an eternity of, uh, what would we call it, uh, boredom, or worst case, you know, outrageous diatribes. Um, you know, with the caps and the gowns, you know, I've, I've myself, I've celebrated and have been part of so many graduations and so many different backgrounds, you got the proud parents, the families, joyous graduates, and the well-deserving ritual of paying honor to those who've excelled in their studies. So I want to tell you something. Um, as long as I can remember, one of the major highlights of a graduation ceremony was the tribute to the person selected as the valedictorian. This was the top student, could rightfully revel in his or her achievements. This was public recognition of, of the superior effort and scholarship, which was more than, uh, you know, reward for the deserving. It was also meant to inspire others, of course, to aim high and to hopefully reach the peak of their potential. But today, <laughs> my friends, things have changed. It seems that the class valedictorian is fast becoming an endangered species. Not that the title doesn't uh, no longer exist. It's just that its definition has been changed so much that it threatens to become more and more meaningless. Who is today's valedictorian? At first, I thought this was a joke, but it seems it's a trend. It, I was reading that in certain schools, they had 21 valedictorians. In another school in Pennsylvania, they graduated 24 valedictorians out of 251 seniors. Down in Alabama, as reported by NBC News, it boasts that 34 graduated, granting this distinction of being the valedictorians. I imagine we can soon look back or look forward to an entire class being designated as valedictorians so as not to hurt the feelings of anyone who is in this age of entitlement, can't understand why they're not equally deserving of honor. Some progressive schools today are doing away with the concept of grades for the very same reason. They believe that for a child to be told that he's not as smart could be very damaging to his psychic. Even sporting events in some places no longer keep score because they would only reinforce the politically incorrect idea of winners and losers. So I want to, you know, we're going to have some interviews now of those who did graduate and what their message may be. But what's behind this fear of acknowledging superiority? It's something worth listening to and thinking about. You see, there's a terrible misunderstanding of the ideal of equality. It's really a distortion that has turned the noble concept of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal into a bizarre notion that recognition of greater achievement 
and excellence of others must be renounced as alien to the concept of democracy. The American founding fathers never meant to assert the false notion that all of us share identical intellects, skills, or talents. It is self-elevant that we all are not equal in many ways. There are people who are smarter, more athletic, more artistic, more music musically talented and gifted in a host of other ways than I am. So what the Constitution so powerfully granted us was an equality more fundamental than physical or mental attributes. And I'm about to let it out of the bag. What do you think the Constitution meant by talking about equality? And if people thought about this today, a lot of the problems that we're facing would disappear. And what is that? What is the Constitution talking about? Not the physical or mental attributes, but the equality of man before God and the law. And if there was that recognition of the equality of man before God, God was brought into the equation, a lot of the problems that we're facing now, the discussions and the, 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 the vitriol discussions that we have and the attitudes would disappear. Yes, we are equally entitled to the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. But that doesn't remove us from the obligation to respect those who have achieved more than we did, to pay tribute to those who did, by dint of their effort or godly gifts, have gone beyond our abilities, and to acknowledge those who are worthy of admiration and emulation. The Torah long ago made clear this distinction. Moses was the greatest leader of our, of our people. Indeed, according to Maimonides, there was nobody, uh, you know, nobody has risen in Israel as great as Moses. Yet during his tenure, there were those who questioned his authority. The Torah tells us about Korah, a prominent descendant of Le Levi, together with 250 princes of the congregation. They led a rebellion on, their, on a platform that is seemingly rooted in an ideal of democracy. What did he say? You take too much upon yourself, seeing that the entire congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among... What do you think? All of us are equal, his argument was. We are just as good as you are. What Korach demanded was everybody be accorded the same honor as Moses. Come on, come on. Everybody has their role in their mission. Even in a democratic society with equal rights, not everyone is equal in talent and influence. So Korach confused the congregation's status of holiness, somehow automatically granted to them from birth, which is as children of God and creating the image of God, with a far greatest spiritual level of a man who earned the right to eventually speak with God face to face. So what Korach needed to learn was that even in a democratic society with equal rights, not everyone is equal in talent and influence. When we fail to acknowledge this truth, we create a society devoted to defying or deifying the mediocre and downgrading the gifted. And shame upon us if in pursuing a false interpretation of equality, we end up destroying its true goal, which is what? To allow every one of us in our own way to achieve our personal greatness. So, dear friends, more about this, but let's now go to um, uh, some interviews that we have with some special individuals. And I put this question out to uh, an individual who is a leader in his community as part of graduations, a teacher in, in the high school graduations. So we have someone we're going to talk to, to in the college scene, what the message of graduation should be in the public school, and then from a young man who just graduated in, uh, from his yeshiva from the elementary school. Let's first welcome uh, Rabbi Lipska. We now reach out to Rabbi Yankel Lipsker, Director of Chabad at Adelphi University in Garden City, New York. You are honored, Rabbi, to make the invocation at the graduation exercises recently at Adelphi University. And we invite you today, as we're talking about graduation and its meanings, what is your message to the graduates of the uh, Delphi University students of 2022 during these rather confusing times. 
Hi, Ben Pro. Thank you for having me. Um, first off, first of all, I wanted a chance to say goodbye to my students, and I wanted a chance to express gratitude to President Reardon and everyone who makes such a wonderful environment that we have. It really, really is a very family-like environment by us. The message that I have for people is that right now they're, they're leaving you know, the cocoon, and they're going out into the real world, and it's so easy to go into the real world and just... You, everything is so chaotic. It's very easy to see chaos. And I wanted them to try to look for the meaning in everything, see the divine in everything, not just to look at chaos and see chaos, but that there's a reason why everything is happening, and hopefully they can find their place and see the meaning. Wonderful. And um, d did you find on campus that the students were concerned about going out into the cocoon in, in this, during these you know, difficult times? There's always the fear of the unknown. I mean, change is scary. Right. Well, I, I thank you for that, and I and I actually have uh, heard back f from your wonderful presentation and the reaction from everybody that you created an environment of home. Adelphi is their home, and they can always come back to you and and be inspired into the future. So, I, I thank you, Robert Lipska, for taking the time and giving you this important message, not to be afraid as they go out into the world. Thank you and continued success in your important work. I mean, I mean, you too, thank you for having me. So dear friends, what you heard here was the rabbi was explaining that if a person lives with divine providence, as they go out into the world, out of the cocoon, they're going to be able to handle it much better. That's a very powerful message of how to look at the world during these challenging times. Now I invite uh, another wonderful teacher from a public school to share with us um, what he feels and what his message is to those who are now graduating from public high schools. Hi, at uh, this time, ladies and gentlemen, we are now welcoming to our Newsmaker Hotline a social studies teacher, school and community leader in the, uh, for the school program at the JFK High School in Belmore. Let's welcome Brad Seidman, and um, Brad, you've been very, very helpful in uh, identifying wonderful young men and women who are nominated for the Goodie Awards for Long Island Teenagers, a well-known program here in Long Island. And now that we've come to the end of the school year, I thought uh, it would be important for us to hear from you as a leader in the public school system, uh, what message you would like to share about the um, to, for the graduating class of the year 2022, especially during these rather confusing times. Right. Well, thanks for having me. Um, there's a quote by former baseball commissioner Bart Giamatti, who said, "Leave room in your life for serendipity." It's about the unexpected. Um, these graduates have faced the unexpected in their high school career, and they have emerged victorious. They will do well or even better in their lives from living through this moment. Are you speaking specifically about the, the COVID period the last couple of years or in general? Yes. It's been very hard uh, being able to do, I guess, uh, work on school on Zoom and in, ha in school and back and forth. So um, nevertheless, you feel the, the graduates for this year, 2022, are well adjusted and um, ready to take on the world? Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. I do. I, I, I think they have um, faced the most unusual times, um, and uh, it will only help them and make them better uh, in their futures. Well, thank you, Brad. And I do appreciate your ongoing leadership in school and in the community. We wish you success into the coming years. And we do appreciate um, your efforts in helping identify there's so many wonderful young men and women who do good deeds, do community leadership activities, and uh, we do really uh, t a note of thanks to you for, for uh, helping us all these many years. I appreciate you having me. Thank you, Rabbi, for everything. You're welcome. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. So thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad, and thank you to Rabbi Lipska. And uh, we'll continue this now because... Brad spoke in terms of, of uh, 
a high school, a public high school with wonderful students. Um, Rabbi Lipska spoke more to uh, those gra- uh, graduating from university. And now we'd like to hear from a young man who uh, just graduated from elementary school. And let's go now to my uh, Mendel Goldberg. Continuing our conversations with uh, special persons during this graduation season, uh, we've heard from so many. We'd like to now reach out to a young man who has just graduated elementary school from a yeshiva. This is called Ali Torah, a very, very prestigious elementary school in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, New York. We're speaking to Mendel Goldberg, whose graduation event took place this past Sunday. So welcome, Mendel. And um, Mendel, can you tell us, you know, everybody's listening, we'd like to hear from you, we've heard from adults, but what message did you take as a student at your graduation? What, what did you go away with? So the main number one message which I took away from the graduation and all that was going on and all the encouragement and music and whatever, the whole inspiration was really how we're not, we're not ending, we're not finishing off, we're not saying goodbye, the end, now we're free, we just go on wherever we feel like. There's still, we, 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 in a certain way, it was a completion. It's, a, it's an accomplishment. We have now accomplished and we finished a lot of years of, of learning and growing. And now we accomplished that. We're celebrating that accomplish, accomplishment which, yeah, which we have just completed. But now, it's not that we're finished. It's that now that we have grown so much, let's go take our new strengths with me, which we have found within ourselves and now let's use those and let's go higher. And let's go in as we go into next years of higher level learning and higher level growing even greater and stronger. Let's use our what we have accomplished and take it at the next level. Let's not stop here or keep on going higher and higher and higher from strength to strength. That was really my number one takeaway from like, the graduation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to tell you all a little secret, uh, Mendel, Mendel Goldberg, is the son of our daughter and son and son-in-law, Rabbi Yechiel and Hannah Goldberg. So this means that Mendel Goldberg is our grandchild. And I had the great uh, merit to be able to be there and to see Mendel graduate with more than a hundred of his uh, friends in the class of that particular grade. And it was really a very inspiring graduation. So you, you look forward to going from strength to strength in, in your learning and uh, all these many years is really, in a sense, preparing you to, to go on from strength. So what, what um, from all the many years that you've been learning, is there any particular subject that you, you found most inspiring and most uplifting? I have found Gemara, the Talmud, very, very interesting and good. many times it takes a lot of brains, brain strength to think and use use the Talmud goes, goes can go very deep and it can go really 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 sh- using a lot of brain power to go figure out. I personally enjoy enjoy that. I also enjoy Chassidus, which is more of a um, um, it's the deeper 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 meaning of many 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 physical things. It's deep deeper dimension of. Many things go on in your day-to-day life that you don't realize have so many deeper meanings within them. I personally enjoy that as well. A little too out of many things, in, g- in general, I do enjoy learning. But those two things I think are generally my two main topics which I enjoy so, most. So, uh, thank you, Mendel. So I, if I understand you correctly, whether it's thinking about the Gomorrah subjects, whether it's thinking about Hashem, the Hasidus emphasizes how God is found in so many things that physical and spiritual are not really in competition with each other. Really, it's the body and the soul that brings them both together. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that uh, as I sat there, Bluma, my dear wife, was, on, was there as well. And they showed us a video uh, of all the accomplishments of these young men over the many years. And what impressed me was that throughout the the years in elementary school yes in the yeshiva but they had plenty of time to do all kinds of 
hands-on projects, how to make a chauffeur, uh, great food. And it was like, to me, it seemed to be a very beautiful balance that you could be involved in observant life and yet enjoy the world and bring the holiness to the world on, on all kinds of things. So mental, in, in honor or I guess as a gift to the class, you went on a uh, end of your trip. Where did you go and what was the highlight of your trip? Hmm. I went to Lake Doors, very gorgeous and stunning place, upstate in some very, very nice and fresh. We camped out there overnight. It was a two day trip. Oh, what was my highlight there? As fun, I personally enjoyed most was the, was the boating, was the motor boating out in the water. And they went tubing back, falling into the water. Everybody lived a lot of fun. Wow. Really enjoyable. Well, I want to thank you again, M Mendel, for joining us and sharing with us and inspiring us. And all of us wish you continued success in your learning, you go from strength to strength, and to continue to give your parents and your family wonderful nachas as you grow uh, in every aspect of your life. So thank you again. Mazel tov to you and to all the graduates out there uh, as they too take their places in this world. Thank you again. Thank you, dear friends. All those interviews uh, speak for themselves. And I'd like to uh, hear from you now. If you would like to join in the conversation for a couple of minutes, we're at 516-572-7440. 516-572-7440. I remind you that if you only have one four on your telephone, just press it twice. 516-572-7440. And the question right now is, is do you, can you give us a very briefly one one memory uh, from your graduations, whenever it happened, and how it may still linger or inspire you in our times. So again, 516-572-7440, and to join us in this conversation. I was actually at that graduation of my grandson, and it really was a wonderful, they did uh, have everybody uh, speak, uh, uh, every single child using modern day technology, every single ch uh, young man had a chance to speak on the video about, about, the, about their accomplishments. And yet at the same time, they did honor uh, several young men who uh, had excelled in, in even more in their, in their study. So there was a wonderful balance of appreciating everybody working hard at the same time um, recognizing and uh, those who had gone the extra mile as we talked about the importance of recognizing uh, those who have worked even harder and harder and therefore uh, get that recognition so again 516 let's see now 5727440 we want to make sure our telephone lines are working here let me just check to see if there's a dial tone yes they did play there they, they, they pay their bill yes 516-5727440 the, um, over the years, the Rebbe actually uh, sent a message to a graduating class. So we actually have from the Rebbe um, his thoughts on what a graduation should be and what it should represent. Um, and in, in it was a, this was a, this is an excerpt from a letter of the Rebbe speaking about graduations. And the Rebbe sends his greetings and blessings to the graduating students. Uh, uh, all the participants in the in this uh, the Rebbe calls it a Torah celebration. The Rebbe speaking to to uh, a Lubavitcher school, and uh, as emphasized on many occasions, I hope that the graduation celebration will serve as a preparation and a beginning for a higher level of studying Torah and fulfilling mitzvahs. For this is the true content of what a Torah graduation in general and the yeshiva graduation in particular. And the Rebbe points out that the Torah portion of the week is Baha at that time, when you're talking about lighting candles, kindling the lights. It begins with Moses was commanded to tell, teach Aaron to kindle the lights of the menorah in the, in the sanctuary and in the temple. It was not sufficient for Aaron to merely apply the flame to the wicks, it was an integral part of the mitzvah for him to continue holding the kindling, the flame, to, an, to the new wick until it caught on properly and the newly kindled flame was flickering upwards all by itself. And the Rebbe continues, the Torah is eternal and immortal. And this was the message the Rebbe spoke to the, to, the, to the students. 
the men and the women, the boys and the girls, because Torah is teaching is eternal for all times and all places. And therefore, there's a deeper sense, the idea of kindling the lights is relevant to all of us at all times. We all have a light inside of us called the soul, literally part of God. And all of us have the opportunity to shine. It is also, just as Aaron made sure that the lights were by themselves, not only does it apply to ourselves, uh, make sure that what we've studied and what we've gained from our years in school should light us up, but also we should share that with others. This was the uh, key message of the Rebbe, that each and every one of us have the responsibility to light up others and to make sure that they too can light and bring light to the world all by themselves, that that individual independent abilities to make this world a beautiful place. So the Rebbe concludes, I hope as students of, of Lubavitch, you will always remember that you must be lights to shed light, brightly burning lights who must also kindle and illuminate others as well. And of course, this also falls under the, the important, uh, important teaching of love your fellow as yourself. And the Rebbe concludes, may the Almighty grant you great success in the above and may you bring your blessings and success in all of your affairs. So you see, dear friends, the Rebbe's view of graduating, of course, is recognizing, as my grandson said, where we've accomplished at the same time to use it as a springboard to go on and not only for themselves but to make a difference in the world around us and that's what i got took away from the graduation of my uh, graduate of my grandson is the fact that they 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 balance their time with serious study and yet they also spend time uh, going to hospitals and to businesses and encouraging others to put on tefillin and learning how to speak to the world in a nice way, in a kind way, and offer words of encouragement and uplifting. And my friends, in our day and age, we need that kind of education, where all of us, in a sense, have uh, feel the responsibility to make a difference in this world. And that, that's the kind of education uh, or graduation that I attended, and I came away really inspired by how the teachers and the uh, principals made an effort to include everybody, there was a tremendous sense of equality, and yet at the same time, a great effort was made to recognize that if you work harder, you're going to be recognized, and uh, all of us are inspired by that. So, um, dear friends, as you know, I'd like to remind everyone again that um, our program comes each Sunday with God's help. It starts at 8 a.m., so we have an extra 30 minutes for the opportunity to hear and to have interviews and to hear from you as well. So let me um, move to a very, very serious subject in the, um, at the moment, this particular time, which is taking up a lot of time in the world. And that is, of course, is the issue of what the Supreme Court did. And I'd like to, you know, just share with you, uh, I, I would like to call it comments or a statement to help us appreciate that. Um, because in truth, if we think openly and, and less emotionally, we can appreciate from the Jewish perspective that uh, we neither can we mourn or celebrate the news of what the Supreme Court has just done overturning Roe versus Wade. Because we cannot simply um, support absolute bans on abortion at any time uh, point in the pregnancy. That would not allow access to abortion in life-saving situations. Similarly, we cannot support legislation that permits abortion on demand at any time point in the pregnancy and does not confine abortion to situations in which medical, including mental health professionals, affirm that carrying the pregnancy to term poses a real uh, risk to the life of the mother. As people of faith, we see life as a precious gift granted to us and maintained within us by God. Jewish law places paramount value on choosing life and mandates, not as a right, but as a responsibility, safeguarding our own lives and lives of others by behaving in a healthy and secure manner, doing everything in our power to save lives and refraining from endangering others. This concern for even potential life extends to the unborn fetus and to the terminally ill. Abortion on demand, the right to choose, as well as the right to die, 
are therefore completely at odds with our religious and halachic values. Legislation and court rulings that enshrine such rights concern us deeply on a societal level. Yet, that same mandate to preserve life requires us to be concerned for the life of the mother. Jewish law prioritized the life of the pregnant mother over the life of the fetus, such that where the pregnancy critically endangers the physical health or mental health of the mother, an abortion may be authorized, if not mandated, by Jewish law and should be available to all women irrespective of their economic status. Legislation and court rulings federally or in any state that absolutely bans abortions without regard for the health of the mother would literally limit our ability to live our lives in accordance with our responsibilities to preserve life. So the extreme, this is, I must conclude this way, the extreme polarization around and the political side of the abortion issue does not bode well for a much needed nuanced result and approach. Human life, the value of everyone created in the image, in the, in the divine image, is far too important to be treated like a political football. So, dear friends, much more to be discussed about this, and, but I just wanted to share with you that we have to be very careful. Someone said to me in shul, Rabbi, what's your opinion on this? I said, if you expect me to say yes or no, I'm never going to do that. But I will tell you, the answer to this issue is, it all depends. It all depends. The circumstances, either way. So, Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I, I take this opportunity to, to really thank you for staying with us for the entire hour from 8 until this, this moment. I hope you appreciate um, the, the, uh, the opportunity given to us and we will be able to have more interviews and discussions. And I just want to conclude with this short story. You mentioned how if a person gives thanks to Hashem, he's going to live a much more happier world. If a person is, is, shows gratitude and verbalizes it, it makes it uh, makes life much more easier and much more happier. And uh, this story uh, it goes back to the 50s, where a young man was delivering uh, food to Rabbi Schneerson's mother, Rebbe Sanchana. And a young man, and he asked the he asked the uh, the Rebbe's mother an interesting question. He said, "Tell me, what's the Rebbe's favorite uh, prayer?" Can you imagine Rabbi Schneerson? What would be his favorite prayer? He, he said, "I don't know, but next time." You come, I'm going to ask him and let you know what the Rebbe's favorite prayer is. And when he came back the next day or the next couple of days to, to bring the, the groceries there, she told him that the Rebbe's favorite prayer is Maida Ani, is giving thanks to Hashem. And uh, Nachum, the young man, was thankful for that. And he wasn't sure why would the, why would the, uh, the Rebbe, like, he was thinking, why would the Rebbe like this particular prayer? Well, what we've said earlier on today, we can appreciate because you verbalize thanks in the morning. You start the day off by saying thank you to Hashem. You're going to live a much happier and a much more uplifting day. But there's also something deeper as well, because the last two words in this prayer of thanks in the morning says, great is your faithfulness. What does it mean? The translation of this prayer is, I give thanks to you, living and lasting King, that you restored my soul with compassion. Great is your faithfulness. What does it mean, great is your faithfulness? And the Rebbe explained, it is God's faithfulness in us. God has faith in us. Every single day, God returns our soul to us because he has faith in us that we're going to make and use it well, that we can make a difference, make the right choices, and change the world for good. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Stay well and looking forward to the next time. Have a wonderful week.